Thank you so much. Thank you for, again. Thank you everyone for being here. As Luke mentioned, I am the Maryland Executive Director with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation based in Annapolis, Maryland, and joining you here today from Tangier Sound in Virginia. And I'm pleased to be talking with you guys today about blue catfish. Hopefully it's something that you've heard of because that means all of the marketing efforts are working. But if not, I hope by the end of today's talk that you all will be familiar and eager to help us out with the, with the issue of invasive catfish in the Chesapeake Bay. Um, can I get the next slide, Luke? Okay, there you go. For anyone who is not familiar with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, the way that I like to uh, quickly orient people is we are the bumper sticker people, not the license plate people. We realize and recognize that there are many organizations working and doing wonderful work um, on the Chesapeake Bay that have similar names to ours. But the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, uh, next slide please was founded in Annapolis in 1967. So we've been doing this work for more than 50 years at this point. And this is an early photograph of our CBF staff. And you can see the uh, dome of the State House, Maryland State House in the background there. And we were really started as a group of concerned citizens, particularly sailors and other folks who like to recreate on the water, who were noticing some significant changes right in their backyards. So areas like the Severn River near Annapolis or Spa Creek near Annapolis and noticing that the water quality was changing, the number and type of fish that they could find was changing, the grasses were disappearing and were motivated by their own experiences to take this on as a challenge, um, as a community and as an organization. So um, we have been working towards that end, towards our mission, which is saving the bay since 1967. And we focus mainly on four topic areas or four approaches to do that. Next slide, please. The first of those is education. We really believe that environmental education and empowering and educating the next, uh, next generation of environmental stewards um, is critical to our long-term success. So we have a very, um, you know, highly, highly awarded, highly prized environmental education program that runs throughout um, all of the areas where CBF is active. So we have um, offices in Maryland, Virginia, and Pennsylvania, and we have education programs scattered throughout all three states, um, including residential island centers like the one I'm at right now, where students will actually come and stay overnight and get to do some hands-on experiences to experience, you know, crab dredging, um, oyster dredging, bank traps, finding um, critters out in the bay, traipsing through the marsh, um, these really transformative educational experiences. We also do ed day education programs uh, throughout the watershed as well. Many folks, when I go to give presentations about the Chesapeake Bay Foundation and I ask people to raise their hands on how many people had the opportunity to experience a CBF restoration program throughout their lifetimes, it's usually at least one um, and typically many more in the audience who are able to raise their hand and say at, at some point the Chesapeake Bay Foundation education program was a part of my upbringing. So we focus on K-12 education but we have also in recent years expanded to support um, college students who are interested specifically in environmental advocacy um, through a program called the Bay Advocacy Institute. In Maryland specifically, we support uh, about 30,000 students a year coming through those programs. Next slide, please. Another big part of our work is advocacy, and that's mainly um, the department that I work in is called Environmental Protection and Restoration, and we are primarily responsible for advocacy work for the organization. We do work in each of the three states, Maryland, Virginia, and Pennsylvania, working on state-level um, regulations and legislation to help support um, activities and programs that improve bay water quality and habitat. Um, the two young ladies pictured here are actually part of our student leadership program. So again, when we inspire these young people to get involved and get interested in environmental issues, a lot of them then say, well, I want to do more. Um, so each year we host um, an advocacy day where we have high school students who are interested in being advocates and leaders come in and actually talk to legislators uh, about their interests in the Chesapeake Bay and cleaning it up. So it's a really inspiring day both for the students and the legislators, and um, a really also effective way to get our messaging out on some key legislation that we work on every year. Next slide, please.
Sorry, guys, I'm trying to... I hit a button on my Zoom and I'm not used to this. My bad. <laughs> it's all good. Well, to give you guys a preview, I believe the next one is litigation. There we go. Oh. There we go. Thank you. Sorry about that. Perfect. No worries. Thank you, Luke. Um, so, you know, despite all of the work that we and others do to get good rules and regulations on the books, those don't necessarily mean anything if they're not being effectively enforced. Forced. And so the other role that our organization plays is, a, is as a watchdog, um, ensuring that enforcement is occurring when it needs to occur. And sometimes that includes litigating um, either against regulatory agencies for lack of enforcement action or specific polluters who are not uh, complying with their permit terms. Whatever that looks like, it is one of the tools that um, is somewhat unique to the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. There's fewer organizations that do litigation than do advocacy in this space. And so that's one of the ways that we try and support our community partners is by supporting litigation um, to get us closer to big cleanup goals. Next slide, please. Lastly, we also do on the ground restoration. So um, this is typically focused in a few core areas. What you're seeing here in this slide is our oyster restoration program. Um, and so those are bags of oyster shell, which have been set with oyster larvae and are being placed out into, um, will eventually be placed out into oyster sanctuaries throughout the state. Our primary motiv motivation is restoring the ecosystem function of oysters, which has really been lost over the past years or so. So we are planting oysters into areas that will not be harvested so that we can help restore the their uh, water filtration capacity, their ability to provide habitat to fish, crabs, and other species, and rebuild oyster reefs. On land, we focus a lot on uh, reforestation, riparian buffers, planting trees in a lot of areas to help support biodiversity and habitat. We're particularly working on um, riparian buffer restoration with uh, farmers and trying to improve uh, the quality of streams that are running through agricultural lands while also protecting them from uh, runoff of, of nutrients that may come from those farm fields by uh, reinstituting either forested buffers or grass buffers in those areas. Next slide, please. But now that you have an introduction to what we do as an organization, I thought it would be great to dive into um, today's topic, which is blue catfish. Um, blue catfish is a non-native and invasive species of catfish to the Chesapeake Bay. Its scientific name is Ictalorus forcatus, um, and it is a member of the um, Siliformes order, which is important when we talk about regulations later on in in today's presentation. Um, it's really a very distinct fish. It has this very uh, blue silvery back and a white underbelly, a forked tail, and obviously the giveaways for catfish are those, those barbels which they use to, to sense and find prey. Um, this species can grow to more than 100 pounds and over five feet long, so it can really be a very large, impressive, and also formidable predator in the Chesapeake Bay. Next slide, please. Uh, it's not the only invasive catfish that we have in the Chesapeake Bay watershed, although it is the one you will hear the most about, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later, having to do with its prolific nature and range expansion. But there are some significant differences between blue catfish and flathead catfish, which is another invasive catfish species. Obviously their coloring is very different. Um, that mottled brown color for the flatheads versus the sleek silvery blue for the blue catfish, their shape of their tails is different as well. And if anybody wants to get close enough and spend enough time, you can go ahead and count their anal fin rays to see that uh, there are much fewer anal fin rays on the flathead catfish than there are on the blue catfish. Um, I would say it's pretty easy to tell between these two just some, from some visual cues, um, which invasive catfish you might be looking at. Not pictured here is also another non-native catfish that we have in the Chesapeake Bay, the, um, the channel catfish. And the channel catfish is not native, but it's not considered invasive. Um, so it is, it's, you know, populations are much smaller and it's not considered to have a significant ecological impact on the native fish that we have in the Chesapeake Bay. So when we're talking about kind of targeting and moving invasive catfish, um, all, my focus today is obviously blues, 
but also flathead catfish are kind of in that category as well as ones that we are really interested in in removing from the ecosystem because of the, the negative impacts that they're having. Next slide, please. So I wanted to show you all this. Um, there's actually um, an a, a animation of this uh, map, but what you see shaded here is the um, is the native range of blue catfish. So you can see it's basically the Ohio Mississippi River basins um, and their tributaries that feed into them. So they are native to the U.S. Unlike, for example, folks may have heard of northern snakeheads or Chesapeake Chana, as many are referring to them now, which are actually from Southeast Asia. Um, unlike those snakeheads, they are native to the U.S., just not at any of the eastern um, seaboard tributaries or, or basins. And the red dots that you see on the map are areas where blue catfish have been introduced over the years. So you can see that this is not a, a, an issue that is limited to the Chesapeake Bay. The blue catfish have been picked up and moved to many different places intentionally or unintentionally um, many different times over the course of the past hundred years. Um, but it also would show the animation. So be careful when you click loop, because if you click the video, it will go to the animation. So if we want to just advance the slide, you'll have to click the heading. But anyways, um, uh, there's many different places where it was originally introduced. So blue catfish was actually in the Chesapeake Bay introduced intentionally, believe it or not, um, in the 1970s by um, the state of Virginia into the James River. They were looking to support recreational fishing opportunities in that river in areas where other native fish species were struggling at the time. And the thought and the logic uh, during that introduction was catfish are considered a freshwater species. And so it was thought that these blue catfish would remain where they were originally stocked up in the, the tidal freshwater portions of the river. Um, not really anticipating that they would ever move down or out of the original river where they were stocked because um, they were seen strictly as, um, as freshwater fish. Um, we have come to learn, unfortunately, <laughs> that, um, that they are actually much more tolerant of salinity and various environmental conditions than originally, um, than originally known. And so for, uh, 20 years after the introduction from like the 70s to the mid 1990s, they were uh, expanding in Virginia very slowly, um, but did find those opportunities, for example, in years of low salinity to move out and around to different places. We also suspect and in some cases know that anglers were purposefully introducing them into other areas because as we'll discuss later, um, they are a really fun fish for anglers to fight. And so people want, you know, want that opportunity a little bit closer to home, have been known to pick up uh, and transfer live fish to other uh, river systems. So um, it wasn't until kind of the mid 90s, early 2000s that we started to see blue catfish moving their way into Maryland waters, particularly starting in the Potomac River. And um where we are now is we have seen a rapid range expansion in the past 15 to 20 years. And specifically, and most recently, a very rapid expansion following the, the freshet, record freshet in 2018 and 2019 in the Chesapeake Bay. So in 2018, we had a record amount of fresh water entering the Chesapeake Bay through the Susquehanna, um, which supplies 50% of the fresh water to the Chesapeake Bay from the upper watershed starting in um, Cooperstown, New York, uh, coming down through Pennsylvania and then feeding into the top of the Maryland portion of the bay in Habitat Grace. And we had uh, the highest amount of freshwater flow on record since they started measuring it in the 1940s or 1950s. And what that did is it severely depressed the salinity in the upper portion of the bay and allowed these blue catfish to expand rapidly. The map that you see in front of you is kind of immediately following that freshet where we started to see the expansion of all of these fish into every major tributary system in the Maryland portion of the bay. And then if you could click that, Luke, you'll see that between 2020 and 2023, they have become wholly established in every major portion of the Maryland part of the bay, 
Um, so once those populations were able to expand into additional rivers and tributaries, they are growing and reproducing um, so rapidly that they have now just become uh, dominant species in every river system in the Chesapeake. Um, in the James River, where they were originally introduced in the 1970s, actually estimated that blue catfish make up 70% of the total fish biomass of all fish in that river. So not only are they dominant in numbers, but in terms of total weight of fish of all the fish are, that are there, they're making up about 70% or more. Next slide, please. So why is this an issue? The biggest issue is because of what they eat. So because they are not from this area, they do not have um, very many uh, native predators. Um, there's obviously other fish and birds that can eat these fish when they're small, but the issue is they grow so incredibly rapidly um, that the window in which they're actually uh, subject or in danger of being predated upon by other species is very, very small. Um, and what you'll see, this is a graphic from the Vir Virginia Sea Grant Program um, showing some of the stomach contents that have been found in catfish from different river systems. So you'll see the third one from the left there, the James, that's kind of the original, um, the original population. The Rappahannock, Clamunkey, and Mattapanai are other river systems within Virginia. And you can kind of see some of the various things that have been found. Um, not surprisingly, blue crabs, and we'll talk some more about that, um, clams, um, vegetation in some places. There's also some very interesting items here. <laughs> you may see a plastic, fish hooks, um, chicken bones, which mainly just is a, is a placeholder for kind of like human litter, human waste, um, basically demonstrating that these guys are very opportunistic, very generalist feeders. And it basically, if it's in front of its mouth, it will eat it. <laughs> Next slide, please. So the reason why that's of a concern, apologies, I should have given a trigger warning for anyone who's not into seeing blood and guts and cut up fish, but um, uh, this is a concern because where they are located now, if you look back, think back to that map of Maryland and all of the red area that was covered, these are the primary areas and nursery habitats for many of our commercial and recreationally important species. Um, in particular, blue crabs, Atlantic menhaden, which are an important forage fish, white perch, striped bass, and softshell clams. So if you look at the photograph on the left of this slide, every single one of those is a little softshell clam that was consumed um, by that catfish. We also have significant overlap with species that are depleted. So these are species that are already struggling um, for various reasons, river herring and shad being two that come to mind. Um, these blue catfish typically, when they can, are up in those tidal freshwater areas um, feeding, and those are right in the path of all the anadromous fishes that are trying to get from the ocean up into uh, the bay and then up into the tributaries to spawn. So they're heading straight into the gauntlet or the, the gaping jaws of blue catfish as they head up into their traditional spawning habitats in the Chesapeake Bay. So not only is that a concern from an ecological perspective, but obviously these are very important um, commercial fisheries that support uh, watermen and people making their livelihoods in the Chesapeake Bay region. Next slide, please. I wanted to take a little bit of a deep dive here into blue crabs because there's some timely and relevant concerns related to the overlap of blue crabs and blue catfish and the impacts that catfish may be having on blue crabs themselves. The map that you all see in front of you is again, we're revisiting the James River in Virginia um, and uh, the areas on the left are areas in yellow where catfish were caught in a trawl survey. Um, and the areas on the right are areas where blue crabs were caught in the trawl survey. And you'll see there's many times that you may say, Allison, these dots look like they're in the same place. Well, what that means is those are trawls where when they pulled the trawl, um, they found both blue catfish and blue crabs in the same set. Um, so that means they're having direct spatial overlap between blue crabs and blue catfish. And as I mentioned earlier, 
the thought when these catfish were originally introduced was that they would not be moving into these higher salinity areas, would not be traversing these areas. Um, and that was, you know, kind of thought to be protective of species that spend a lot of their time in higher salinities like blue crabs. But what we are seeing is, is there is some significant overlap in space between these two species. Next slide, please. And what that results in is consumption, not surprisingly. So if you look at this graph on the, on the x-axis or on the horizontal is uh, three different size classes of blue catfish. As you can imagine, you know, smaller mouths feed on smaller things and so on as you get up there. So the diet of um, these blue catfish actually can change over time as they get older. And then on the right hand side, or sorry, left hand side is the mean number of crab eaten. Um, and this is for the, the biomass of the population for each of those areas, the Burwell Bay and the Hog Island on the previous slide was delineated between a red line between the two geographic areas. And what they found, and this is work by Mary Fabrizio's lab at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science, is that this, um, this middle size class of um, blue catfish is eating a tremendous number of blue crabs, particularly in Burwell Bay, which is the further um, south portion of, of the James River. But also that in areas where there's that significant overlap, they are still eating a lot of blue crabs. And this overall estimate was just in that 12 kilometer squared area in the James River that includes Burwell Bay and Hog Island. Um, the annual estimate is that blue catfish in that area are consuming about 2 million blue crabs per year. Um, so that is a significant impact on our blue crab population in the Chesapeake Bay. You know, blue crabs are our most valuable fishery um, in the Chesapeake Bay by dollar value. So there is a significant ecological and economic impact to be explored here. Next slide, please. So the other thing that has been interesting is with some of our other um, species of recreational fish have been struggling as well. Um, striped bass is one that particularly comes to mind. Um, actually, if you could uh, go to the next slide, Luke. Um, striped bass is one that comes to mind. Yellow perch and white perch are also significant um, targets for Maryland and Virginia recreational fisheries. American eel, uh, Maryland, Maryland is actually the largest harvester of yellow eels, American eels, and the entire East Coast, um, some for bait, some for export. And basically what we saw is there's a significant decrease in all of our native species, um, as well as a significant increase, obviously, in the blue cathead, blue catfish, and as I mentioned previously, um, these northern snakeheads. Um, over the same time period. And while obviously there are other environmental conditions, um, fishing regulations, and other things that may be also contributing to declines in native species, um, I think most of us are, are resigned to the fact that these uh, invasive catfish are likely having an impact on our native species as well, even if we're not yet able to quantify this. So the um, the other thing is that although the harvest has increased significantly, so for catfish specifically 287% since 2012, you can see on the right-hand column the average price per pound that they actually are much less valuable per pound um, than some of those other fisheries. So even though um, folks are able to kind of switch, um, particularly commercial fishermen are able to kind of switch from one species to another relatively easily. That doesn't necessarily mean that the, the economic support um, and the economic benefits are there because they're not, uh, they're not fetching a similar price per pound as some of our native species. I'll point out too that this graph or this chart actually comes from a letter written by Governor Wes Moore to um, the Secretary of Commerce, um, who oversees the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, also known as NOAA. Um, NOAA actually administers a fisheries disaster program. Um, and this was from a letter in which the governor 
uh, requested the declaration of a fisheries disaster in Maryland due to the negative impacts that blue catfish were having on our native species. This is a, a program with that which would have then unlocked federal funding to support watermen, support processors, um, other programs which help to mitigate the economic and ecological impacts of a fisheries disaster. Unfortunately, that uh, disaster request was denied. Um, so that that mechanism for federal funding is not going to be coming through for Maryland. So we have to look at other policy and management solutions to try and get at this problem. Next slide, please. So moving into solutions, um, if you can't beat them, eat them is one of the uh, it's one of the invasive species taglines, and this is certainly one of those areas where um, we are deploying that as a solution to this problem. Um, what you see here is a uh, catfish catfish pot where uh, Rocky Rice, who's a waterman on the Potomac, is harvesting catfish, um, and as you saw previously, the harvest has increased significantly over time. Go ahead, Luke. Um, with this graph showing the increase in commercial landing in pounds between 2012 and 2023. And it has basically been an exponential increase over that time period. We don't see that slowing down anytime soon. Um, but also recognizing that um, this is going to be a very difficult thing. And I think most folks who work in this space and are familiar with blue catfish recognize that um, it's not any species that we will ever be able to fully eradicate from our ecosystems um, and that we will, you know, try to mitigate and reduce the impacts to the environment and the, and the ecosystem as much as possible. But we are likely in a situation where we were going to have to learn how to best live with catfish and reduce the impacts as much as possible. Next slide, please. So some of the other things that have put in, been put in place to try and um, increase the harvest of blue catfish, uh, one, they have made a new license, commercial license for trot lining. They've expanded the, the types of gear that can be used for commercial harvest of blue catfish to include trot lines, bow fishing, um, and they've made those licenses very inexpensive. I believe they're around $15. Um, and they don't require you to have the overarching title fish license, which are not currently available. There's a wait list. So anyone can really get into commercial catfishing at any point for just $15. Um, because we're looking for, for more people to help contribute to removing these from the bay. Um, on the recreational side of things, they're... There's no creel limit, there's no size limit, so you can harvest as many of these fish um, in a single day as you'd like. The photo that you see here is actually from a weigh-in station at a uh, blue catfish derby. So um, folks are trying to encourage recreational anglers to target blue catfish, um, either for a bounty or for a tournament prize or um, many other ways that folks are being rewarded for their harvest of blue catfish. Um, and the good news is, is that recreational anglers seem to really enjoy targeting blue catfish. Um, there have been several businesses that have popped up with respect to guide services that specialize in blue catfish um, because it provides, you know, still a really great angling experience for folks who want to get out on the water um, have a good fight with a fish. Um, and frankly, there's so many of them out there that you're likely to be successful anytime you head out. So um, it has become kind of a, a, a good alternative target to some of our native species, which are not doing as well. Next slide, please. And uh, I couldn't leave today's presentation without plugging one of our own um, efforts to try and target blue catfish. The Chesapeake Bay Foundation each year partners with Coastal Conservation, um, Coastal Conservation Association Maryland, which is a recreational angling advocacy organization, to host the Rod and Reef Slam fishing tournament. We have an invasive species division where um, the person with the largest three fish stringer of blue catfish, snakeheads, channel cats, and several others um, will win a grand prize in our invasive species division. So that's coming up September 7th through the 15th this year with a great after party at CBF's headquarters in Annapolis on the 15th, where we give out all of our great prizes and awards. 
Um, and if you'd like some more information on that or how to register or how to join us for the party, um, the URL is there, cbf.org slash slick. Next slide, please. The other thing, once you harvest all these catfish, especially looking at how quickly we have increased the harvest, commercial harvest of blue catfish, is you need somewhere for them to go. Um, so Maryland has invested heavily in seafood marketing of blue catfish to try and develop and support additional markets for us to um, basically send all of these harvested blue catfish to. So um, ChesapeakeBlueCatfish.org has created on the left this logo and sort of brand which helps educate consumers about blue catfish. One of the things that's really challenging about this fish in general is people typically associate catfish with bottom feeding, tasting kind of muddy, tasting you know, a little bit le less than pleasant perhaps. Um, but this species of catfish in particular, blue catfish is mainly piscivorous, meaning it feeds on fish. Um, they're not bottom feeders like others would, um, would think about some other species of catfish. So really trying to get people familiar with this specific species of catfish, that they eat other fish so they taste great, um, that they are a, a meaty, flaky white fish, which is a great substitute for many other things which aren't as available nowadays as they used to be. Um, and then dem uh, creating demonstrations and recipes and things for people to understand how they can effectively use this fish um, in a way that is both delicious and helping the Chesapeake Bay. So Maryland's best seafood is the Maryland Department of Ag's um, seafood processing excuse me, marketing program. Um, and they have been working hard to market Chesapeake Bay wild caught blue catfish and also to connect wholesalers, processors, and chefs in the area um, to help create additional markets for us to move these blue catfish once they are harvested. Next slide, please. Um, this sort of gets to some of the, the consumer perceptions that I was just mentioning. So these graphs are from um, a consumer um, study that was done by the Virginia Institute of Marine Science and how important this consumer education and marketing is. So what these graphs show is on the left, so the, the tan colored side of the graphs are basically folks who disagree with the statement. On the right hand side for the turquoise colors are, are people who either agree or strongly agree with the statement and the gray is folks who, um, who don't have an opinion on it. Um, and then what you can see is that for people who have consumed catfish before, 46% um, believe that consuming catfish is good for the environment as compared to 35%. Um, if they were told that blue catfish is a sustainable seafood choice, consumers of catfish believe and strongly agree 60% versus 42% for people who did not consume. And that wild blue caught, wild caught blue catfish is safe to eat um, for those who've consumed is 59% versus 38% for those who have not consumed blue catfish before. So what we take from this is a couple things. One, it's really important to get blue catfish on people's plates and in front of them because it really, once they have a chance to experience it, changes their opinions about it and um, its impact on the Chesapeake Bay. But also that it's really important to educate those consumers because once um, they were able to share additional information with those survey participants, they then um, repeated these surveys and were able to show that that consumer education increased their, not only their willingness and interest in consuming blue catfish, but also in the price that they were willing to pay um, to purchase and consume blue catfish, which as I mentioned earlier, when we looked at the comparison of price per pound of what watermen are able to get for blue catfish, as opposed to some of our other native species, that's critically important to get that price per pound up um, so that it makes it more attractive to watermen who are interested in targeting blue catfish because it makes it a much more lucrative harvest for them. Next slide, please. And then lastly, I just wanted to talk about some, some important barriers. So what you see here is a blue catfish processing facility. And most importantly, on the left-hand side, you will see an inspector from USDA, the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Um, blue catfish is the wild caught blue catfish is uh, the only species of fish which requires USDA inspection. USDA inspectors are typical in places that process livestock, that process poultry, 
Um, those are the typical species that are under the inspection purview of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. All other species is typically under the um, inspection and um, safety and health requirements of the Food and Drug Administration. However, because of very large um, interests in catfish farming in the Mississippi Delta area, so actually where these fish are natively from, if we look, remember back to that map that we saw, um, there's a very significant catfish farming industry there, which had some significant concerns about foreign competition for, um, for catfish imports. Um, and because of that, in the 2008 Farm Bill, they instituted additional regulations on the processing of wild-caught catfish, um, which unfortunately has negatively impacted the ability of watermen and processors in the Chesapeake Bay um, to effectively move product very easily because uh, you can imagine in a, in a processing or cutting house in the Chesapeake Bay, they are cutting perch, they're cutting striped bass, they might be working on crabs. Um, all of those species are regulated and their processing is regulated under FDA. And then you bring in a, a harvest of blue catfish to be processed and cut and you have to completely turn over the operation and bring in the USDA inspector, um, completely, you know, shut down and and um, uh, stop those operations, clean everything, get it up to snuff for a different um, inspection and processing procedure under the USDA. So Chesapeake Bay Foundation has been working with the Chesapeake Bay Commission and several others to try and address this regulatory barrier. Um, to catfish processing in Maryland. Uh, we have not yet gotten the, the full fix in. Um, suspect that it will take a change in the farm bill again to really get this turned over. But in the meantime, Maryland's congressional delegation has been really supportive of trying to get funding to help subsidize paying for these USD inspectors. Because the other thing I didn't mention is that the processors are also required to pay for those inspectors to be there. Um, so our congressional delegation has been working towards getting some subsidies um, to help cover that additional cost to Maryland processors who are working to get these catfish out of the bay. Next slide, please. That's it for me. I wanted to just thank you all for having me. I look forward to answering any questions that you all have in the chat. Um, and I just want to thank uh, Luke again for the invitation. Awesome. Thank you, Allison. Uh, we did have a few questions. I know I had some myself too. Um, Anthony Antonucci, thanks for joining. Uh, he asked, uh, does climate change impact catfish and their possible migration of the range up or down the Atlantic coast? Anthony, thank you so much for the question. I would say the primary impact that I can imagine for climate change impacting range shifts or range expansion, um, are due to those rain events. As I mentioned before in 2018, when we had that few huge freshet, um, that's what really allowed the big range expansion in Maryland. And as we move into sort of this new era of climate change, we expect there to be more frequent and more intense storms, which tend to depress the, the salinity of the bay um, more quickly. And so that might be the biggest impact of climate change that I anticipate would allow for additional expansion of blue catfish into new areas. Anthony had a question right before that as well. Um, are there other markets for catfish besides for food? Is there like a fish meal or agricultural use and other types of uh, products that can be made of? Blue yeah, actually, actually there are. Um, there Right now, for folks who are cutting blue catfish, they're, they are saving and, um, and sending the, the heads, the skin, and all of the cuttings to actual pet food production um, facilities. So a lot of it is going into pet food right now. Um, there's also been folks looking into whether we can compost it for agricultural use um, or even you know selling it for retail use for garden beds and things like that. Um, the issue with that is getting it to scale. So I think it's all still on the table as to what the final use of these catfish could be, but it has to be to a point where we can get it to significant scale to handle the volume of fish that we really need to move. Um, and my personal opinion is that our pet food industry is probably the largest um, opportunity there that could still be further tapped. 
um, in terms of providing fish directly to them as opposed to just the heads, the tails, and the other the other cuttings. Great. Cool. Um, well, I wish you luck on that um, farm bill stuff. It sounds like I think there's a new farm bill in negotiation soon. And I do imagine it will take um, movement there to, to some help make some of that more efficient. Um, I know I had a question. Anybody in the audience, if you have new questions, please pop them in the chat. I don't I don't see a Q&A button like I like I have, have had in the past. So I think maybe Zoom has changed their interface a little bit. But pop any questions you have in the chat. I'll ask mine now. Um, you had that uh, in that chart with snakeheads, uh, like an incredible expansion of those populations as well. Is it a, a very similar story with snakeheads and how do they compare with uh, blue catfish? Yeah, that's a that's a good point. So it was over a thousand percent increase in the harvest of snakeheads. I, I think that there's two reasons why we have such an eye popping number in that category. Um, first of all, there there hasn't been any commercial harvest of snakeheads prior to, you know, kind of the time when this was found. Snakeheads were actually found originally in a pond in Crofton, Maryland in about 2005, I believe. Um, and so I think part of the reason why we're seeing over a thousand percent is because we went from zero harvest to now some harvest, whereas the blue catfish have been around for much longer. So there've been a few picked up here and there over the years. Um, particularly in the Potomac where they first became established in Maryland. The other thing is that uh, snakeheads are much less tolerant than blue catfish. So they are typically staying up in those um, tidal freshwater areas. Um, they are much less tolerant of the salinity and, than blue catfish in terms of being moved around to different river systems. Um, they are still of concern, uh, particularly, like I said, with those anadromous fishes that are trying to make their way up into those freshwater areas to spawn things like striped bass, shad, river herring. Um, and so they are of a significant concern there. And I think that the increase in their populations recently is probably why we're seeing such a huge increase in the commercial harvest. Right. Uh, Dave asked, uh, what are some ways that Maryland can get the price of blue catfish to go up? Probably a very complicated answer. It is a very, very complicated answer, especially for someone who is not an economist. But I will say one of the things that um, I know that the Maryland Department of Agriculture Seafood Marketing Program is trying to work on is really trying to market this as a sustainable and kind of luxury seafood product. Um, and, you know, a lot of people associate catfish with being a relatively cheap, uh, you know, seafood product. And in a lot of cases, it's because we have that large volume of, of cat, um, excuse me, farmed catfish um, supplying the market or flooding the market, if you want to put it that way. So I think marketing is one way that we can do it, but we also just need to um, finding additional markets to, to land this product. Um, and, and I think that'll help increase the price overall. Yeah. Increased demand. Yeah. Yeah. Uh... Chris L asked, "Are there other grants for commercial fishermen um, to uh, to help them target blue catfish?" Um, I'd have to get back to you with more information. I know there's currently grants to those processors, as I mentioned, who are getting um, help covering the cost of USDA inspectors. There's also been discussion of actually doing some price support for blue catfish, getting to the previous question as well, where the, you know, the state would guarantee a minimum price uh, for catfish to try and, and bolster people's targeting of them. Specifically grants, um, I'm not sure, but I can follow up. Cool. Uh, Nancy uh, Gladden, thank you, Nancy. Great question here. She asked about the on the uh, inspection standards, is there something happening in the Department of Agriculture inspections that is different that that's important to be meeting? Um, she says, you know, is the presence of blue cats expected to be a long term thing or is it expected to drop off after we uh, target the harvest? Um, so I guess there's two questions. One is, um, yeah, what are the some of the standards that the USDA are bringing in, in the inspection process that FDA doesn't have is a similar process, I guess. Right. And then it's something we should be worried about or, or can, can the FDA handle that stuff? And then longer term, what's that prognosis? Yeah. So um, that's a great question. It's actually one that the government accountability office looked into. So when this first was passed in 2008, it was pretty much flagged straight out the bat that this was going to be a duplicative inspection program between the FDA and the USDA. 
So the Government Accountability Office has done several studies on this, looking at the different inspection requirements. And recall that all of the other seafood species that you're eating from the Chesapeake Bay and elsewhere um, are FDA inspected. So um, there's no issue with respect to the, the standards themselves. And the Government Accountability Office actually estimated that because of this duplicative process, um, it costs the federal government around $14 million a year to keep up these two separate processes. So it's actually costing taxpayers in the long run. And then in the uh, prognosis, um, I think most in the scientific community have um, basically determined that we are not likely to eradicate this species. It's going to be around forever. Um, we're just hoping to help mitigate and reduce uh, the biomass a little bit. As I mentioned, in some river systems, it makes up 70% of all of the fish that are there, um, which just makes it difficult for our other native species to be there and compete. So we're just trying to make a little bit of space in the ecosystem for our native species to come back. Great. Yeah. Uh, Dave Silverstein asked about, um, there seems to be comments on the internet about some danger of eating a fat layer on blue cats. Is it real? Is there any special way to clean off the fat layer? And I have some thoughts about catfish processing that I'll share after you answer too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, actually, University of Maryland Extension put out a great um, fact sheet about this as well. So check that out. Um, but to be fair, um, there are uh, advisories about eating blue catfish because it is a fish that eats other fish. Basically at the top of the food chain, there is the possibility for it to bioaccumulate heavy metals. Um, similar to what folks are probably um, familiar with hearing about things like tuna, bioaccumulating mercury. Um, and the best way to mitigate that is just not eating fish, the largest fish. Um, so they, they have some fish consumption advisories. This is Maryland Department of the Environment typically handles those and they give you some guidance on um, the size of fish that you should be targeting, either commercial or recreational for harvest if you're going to consume it. Um, as well as some preparation instructions on how to minimize um, uh, the number of, you know, how to minimize any metals that might be in the fish that you're eating, as well as how many portions that you should be eating on a monthly basis or weekly basis. And that's, you know, that's typical for any fish coming out of the Chesapeake Bay. We always encourage people to keep an eye on those fish consumption advisories because those things change um, periodically. So um, it's just important to know what you're eating and how best to prepare it. Great. Yeah, I just threw uh, the link to that uh, resource. I think that's the same publication you're talking about in the chat. Yeah, look at it. Um, I personally have found with catfish consumption that uh, my daughter and I caught a giant blue catfish. I think it was nine pounds, which is big for us. And uh, yeah, we I find cutting out any gray flesh along the backbone is very not tasty, as well as any all that fat, anything that's kind of different color. I've decided to trim generously. I used to try to keep every every ounce of meat when I when I harvest things, but I found certainly the gray meat. Cut that out. It is it has a muddy flavor in my experience. Um, yeah. So uh, we have a great one, Anthony. One yeah. other, yeah, I got. I have one other uh, point for that. Um, if you all recall, I showed you the different size classes of blue catfish that were consuming blue crabs, um, and it was that middle size class. Um, and the paper that uh, is from the Virginia Institute of Marine Science has that in it. I believe it's two, something around 250 to 310 millimeters um, are eating the most blue crabs. And the good news is, is that those are the size of the fish that are typically targeted for the, the fishery. Um, they're the size that the processors want. They're the size that, um, that it, you know, fits within those fish consumption advisories. They're the size that recreational anglers are typically finding. So, you know, those fish that are being removed of that size that people are, are eating are also the ones that are most quote unquote dangerous, let's say, to to the blue crab population. So there's good overlap of, you know, eat these blue catfish, save the blue crabs, because the, the size classes that we're harvesting are typically the ones consuming the most. Great. Great. Well, I'll I'll close with one final anecdote of mine. Um, I live close to the Patuxent River, and we like to my daughter and I like to throw out a cast net in the uh, in, and look for bait fish and catch minnows. And once I threw it into, it must have been a pod of uh, young baby uh, blue cats, and we I think we had twelve got caught in the net. And uh, 
in this one little spot. And it was just, it was an eye-opening experience for me to look down the river and think, oh my gosh, how many thousands and thousands are there elsewhere in the river? So uh, certainly a lot of biomass for sure. Um, but I will also say the big catfish that we caught, I was looking at the thing and we pulled it out. And I said, that thing looks gross and there's no way that could taste good. But we cooked it up um, and it was good. I was actually, we trimmed it thoroughly and it tasted good. I was actually quite surprised. It wasn't, um, it was, uh, I would recommend people try it. Uh, Dave asked, do I know if they're in Jug Bay? I almost guarantee it. I know they're in the Patuxent, just about five miles, maybe three miles south of Jug Bay. So I'm pretty sure they're, they're up there. Yeah. And they did a tagging study in the Patuxent specifically. Uh, it's on the Maryland Department of Natural Resources website. So if you're a fan of the Patuxent, um, check it out. They they followed them uh, all over the Patuxent, wherever they were found. Cool. Great. All right. We are just one minute past time. Allison, thank you so much. I'm glad you can make it when you're coming in from a uh, from remote location. Um, thanks. I was, I've been looking forward to this talk. And thanks, everybody, for joining. Uh, uh, and we will feel feel free to fill out the evaluation. Hopefully it pops up when you leave and uh, let us know what you'd like to hear more of. Thank you so much for joining.